I will box. Good evening and welcome to Crawley Borough Council's Overview and Scrutiny Commission meeting of the 2nd of November 2020. Welcome to members of the press and the public watching this meeting live. I am Councillor Tina Belvin, Chair of the Overview, Overview and Scrutiny Commission. This is a meeting being held in public and not a public meeting. There will be no public question time at any council meeting while virtual committee meetings are being held. So I'd like to stress the public and the press can still hear and see the meeting, but public speaking has been suspended and any written questions submitted in advance that were deemed acceptable by the council's monitoring officer will be read out as answered. There will be no supplementary questions. The agenda for this meeting is published and available on the council's website. For any committee meeting held virtually, all voting will be held by a recorded vote taken by a Democratic Service team member on behalf of the chair. The exceptions to this are the approvals, approving of the minutes from the previous meeting or any other procedure item or where the item's sole recommendation to the commission is to note the report. For those items, the chair will move the item and it will be assumed, agreed, unless a dissenting comment from any commission member is made. Before I invite members of the commission to confirm their attendance, I ask that they please ensure their mobile phones are switched off and their backgrounds are plain or nondescript and that they are aware of their surroundings so that they're not disturbed during the meeting. This includes making sure all TVs, radios and smart speakers are switched off, please. Commission members are reminded that they should have their microphones turned off unless speaking and their cameras turned off unless they're requesting to speak. When asked to speak, please turn your camera on, unmute yourself, pause for three seconds to allow the slight time connection delay. With this in mind, Commission members are asked to be aware of who they will follow in the voting process and to prepare accordingly. May I ask the officers supporting this meeting to introduce themselves, given their name and job title. I'm Chris Pedlow, Democratic Services Manager. And here's my colleague. Um, Heather Gerling, Democratic Services Officer. Um, we have um, not received any apologies, although um, Councillor Malik is um, currently having uh, technical issues. And although he received the link as an OSC member, he is unable to view and is only able to view as an attendee. Um, currently, uh, Councillor uh, Lanza is not on the feed and neither is Councillor McElhaney. Thank you. We will now be taking instructions together with items two and three. Please can I ask committee members when called upon to, to confirm their name and, and ward they represent. If they have any declarations of interest and whipping declarations to make. If they agree the minutes of the overview and scrutiny commission held on the 28th of September 2020. Councillor Aylings. Hello, I'm Councillor Aylings. I'm a ward member for uh, Bewbush and Broadfield North. And I have no um, um, disclosure of interest and no whipping um, declarations. Thank you. Councillor Tina Belbin. Good evening. I'm Councillor Tina Belbin. I represent Pound Hill North and Forge Wood. I have no declarations of interest or whipping declarations to make. And I agree the minutes of the overall and scrutiny commission on the 28th of September 2020. Councillor Bob Burgess. Uh, Councillor Bob Burgess, uh, Council Member for uh, Three Bridges Ward. Uh, no declarations of interest, uh, no whipping declarations. I agree the minutes. Uh, Councillor Burgess, we can't actually see you. We can, we can see your background. Um, we can hear you and I'll take it as um, we, you're cleanly in the meeting. OK, Just, thank you. I'll try and sort something out. Thank you. Councillor Barrett. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, 
Richard Barrett, councillor, ward councillor for uh, Pound Hill North and Forge Wood Ward. Um, I, well, having read the presentation um, that was sent around earlier on item five, safe equality partnership update, uh, I probably ought to declare a personal interest as a trustee of Crawley Open House because of a number of references there to Crawley Open House. Um, so I'll do that if necessary, uh, and I'm happy to agree the minutes of the last meeting. I now call Councillor Lanza, who I don't believe is on the call at the moment. No, OK, we'll come back to Councillor Lanza. Uh, Councillor Malik, um, obviously it's been mentioned that he's struggling to get in, um, but as he's not on the members feed, we'll acknowledge he's there, but he's not able to interact in the meeting. Uh, Councillor McElhaney, um, again, he's not appears on the feed. Councillor Pennington. Good evening, uh, Councillor Alison Penlington represents Pound Hill, South and Worth. Um, I have no disclosures of interest or whipping declarations and I'm happy to approve the minutes of the last meeting as correct. Councillor Tahira, Rana. Um, good evening, I'm Councillor Tahira Rana and I'm ward member for Broadfield. I have no whipping, declar uh, whipping declarations and no interest to declare. And I also agree to the minutes of the last meeting. Thank you. Councillor Sharma. Councillor Sharma. Councillor Rai Sharma, Councillor for Southgate. I have no whipping declaration or declaration of interest, and I agree on the minutes of the 20th of September 2020. For clarity's sake, Chair, um, we have Councillor Lamb and Councillor Brenda Burgess is also, also on the call, just for record sake. Can I just say that I didn't say that I agreed the minutes, but I do agree the minutes. Thank you. The Commission agrees that the minutes of the meeting of the Everyone Scrutiny Commission held on the 28th of September 2020 are accurate record of the meeting. So we move on to public question time. Have there been any written quits questions submitted that were accepted under the Constitution and subsequently published in a supplementary agenda? Um, no, Chair, we've had no questions received, thank you. Thank you, Eva. In that case, we start with the Safer Crawley Partnership Annual Update and forthcoming priorities. We have Chief Inspector Shane Baker from Sussex Police and Community Service Manager Paula Doherty. Would you like to provide your presentation to the Commission, please? Please can I ask Paula Doherty, Community Services Manager and Chief Inspector Baker from Sussex Police to provide the pre presentation to the Commission. Bear with me. Apologies for that. I was on mute. Um, so uh, Chief Inspector Baker and I will walk you through the presentation as an update and it's to remind you that it's a review of 1920 um, uh, priorities and, and th features and we will talk about the, the year ahead briefly. So the purpose of the Safe Recorded Partnership is to reduce offending, tackle crime and disorder, antisocial behaviour, um, alcohol and substance misuse and any other behaviour which has a negative impact on the local community so that people that live, work and visit in Crawley feel safe. Our statutory partners are Crawley Borough Council, West Sussex County Council, 
Sussex Police, West Sussex Fire and Rescue Service, Probation Services, Crawley Clinical Commissioning Group, and we have a raft of other partners that join us in this endeavour. So to take you through funding for 1920, we had an allocation from the Police and Crime Commissioner's Office of just under 52,000. And the funding that we I did that we uh, we gave that year were uh, are, are as follows: three thousand to the Women's Step Change Project, five thousand five hundred to support additional community warden activity, thirty five thousand to Greater Change, uh, which is a project providing alternatives to give responsibly to support our homeless communities. We have the Schooly the Crawley Schools Project and the Crawley Open House Outreach Team. I'm going to hand you over to uh, Inspector Baker to walk you through this slide. Thank you, hopefully you can hear me OK. Um, so looking at the crime data there, as you can see on the slide from this slide, we can see that the total crime in Crawley is down 5.6% from this time last year. Um, and in fact, is also slightly lower than the previous year too. Crimes with a domestic abuse marker are up 1.9%. However, a steady rise from the last year could be attributed to some better reporting and more robust recording of offences and um, following some dedicated campaigns. Uh, overall burglary is down 11%. Um, and I would imagine that with more people being inside their homes over this period, this has assisted in reducing domestic burglaries. Crimes with a weapon marker have been increasing. However, similar to domestics, our recording processes of these is always improving and we've run dedicated operations for knife sweeps, such as Operation Safety and Operation Giant to target this. Actual possession of weapons has reduced by 13.5%. And this includes possession of articles with a blade or a point, possession of other weapons and possession of firearms offences. This tells me in essence that the threat of using a weapon may have risen. However, the actual physical possession of these weapons is in decline. Just moving on to the next slide, um, the Crawley Neighbourhood Policing Team. Um, our team's made up of three sergeants, one for each team and seven constables. We do have three more constables starting in December, which will be a busy time for them to hit the ground running. Um, we've got four neighbourhood youth officers as well who cover both Crawley and Mid Sussex, and they get involved in youth related crime and disorder. They liaise with schools, look at diversionary tactics uh, and prevent youth from getting involved in crime. They also seek alternative outcomes to prevent youths getting into the criminal justice system and ultimately they're there to try and prevent the youths um, getting a criminal record. Schemes such as Reboot assist with this and also a new youth matrix system which has been developed to allow us to divert youths who are earlying their offending history to get less formal sanctions uh, in the aim that it prevents their reoffending. Uh, our area PCO, PCSOs are now being deployed into specific beat areas and this gives greater elements of local knowledge and ownership of problems. From a public perspective, this also gives a named contact should they need it. Uh, our PCSO churn at the moment is quite high as we continue to recruit PCs, so the names do change regularly. However, a new change to our website will address this and keep it up to date with changes of specific persons. And many of these PCSOs become PCs later on down the line. However, some just really want to remain as PCSOs and they've got a passion for engagement and talking to people. And this is what we want to harvest as our new PCSOs join us and the existing ones become tutors to the new. Uh, I'm driving a piece of work currently to give all PCSOs a patrol plan so that they engage regularly with key persons within their patch and they have a greater element of accountability for any key issues. OK, looking at the. Um, looking at the review of uh, 1920 achievements and challenges, so serious and organised crime and um, key achievements. There was uh, a school event that was organised last November, whereby presentations to brief year nine pupils of the dangers of county drugs lines, 
the dangers of getting involved and the importance of reporting any concerns to relevant agencies. Uh, also of note, our serious and organised crime priorities were changed this year, uh, not only to now adopt an area which is not just drugs related, but also to ensure that our work is on behalf of the whole of West Sussex as a group. Um, back in about July time, Crawley and Chichester districts swapped serious and organised crime priorities. Um, and this was largely because Chichester had seen issues of border vulnerabilities and immigration crime previously more so than Crawley. And regarding Crawley, current intelligence was suggesting that modern slavery and human trafficking was more relevant to the locality. So looking at other uh, key achievements around the street community, we developed our town centre task force approach and introduced that as a way of talking to partners regularly to tackle the issue uh, of our street community. We uh, used uh, enforcement powers for those members of the street community that were not willing to engage or not able to engage at that time due to the, their complexities and needs. We participated in multiple diverted giving um, events, which again is a way of helping people give responsibly. Uh, and that relates to the next bullet point as well, whereby we have uh, been testing some terminals, uh, do so contactless uh, donation terminals in key locations, although that, that activity has been somewhat stymied by the recent uh, pandemic. We provided some additional funding to call the open house to uplift the, uplift the outreach team uh, due to the level of work that they undertake uh, with us in partnership. That was a key piece of activity. Some of the challenges are clearly that some of our street community struggled to engage with our services, either because of the level of complexity they're facing at the time, or and sometimes just purely because at that particular time in their life, they're just not ready to accept the help. Um, and with that, we understand that there's an impact on the wider community. So this slide talks you through the numbers and I, um, I don't think I need to walk you through point by point because it's quite obvious. You can see that we had some peaks of activity and obviously since the pandemic that those numbers have reduced somewhat. So if I take the count for this year in September, uh, the number of uh, known street communities with known streets, streets uh, sleep sites was 20. Um, it's an issue that we continue to tackle and work in partnership with. Protecting vulnerable individuals is a is a key um, is a is a key piece of our business and our activity. So we continue to raise uh, awareness around issues of domestic abuse. And I know um, Chief Inspector Baker alluded to that earlier. What's interesting is there has been uh, some reports from significant uh, domestic abuse charities of a, an increase in contacts to those. Uh, which doesn't necessarily get reflected in reporting, but we continue to work in partnership around our hate crime activity, etc. The key challenges again are vulnerable individuals who are often chaotic and complex and unable to access support at this time in their lives and providing effective support that sustains progress. We need to understand that when we are working with those vulnerable individuals with complexities, doing what we do for everybody else just generally isn't good enough. We have to do more because for many of those people, they've operated outside of um, regular um, expectations and behaviour. And we need to continue to encourage people to report hate crime. So if I move on to the priorities for 2021, um, what we've worked on as a partnership is thinking about what needs to sit locally. So if you look on the uh, the right hand side of uh, the presentation slide, you'll see that we've got our antisocial behaviour and risk assessment conference approach. That's ASBRAC. So that's really looking at that behaviour that can greatly impede the quality of people's life and their feelings of safety. The next one on the list is the contextual safeguarding peer group. Uh, subgroup and the idea of that group is to really tackle safeguarding issues that often sit outside of a family home. So understanding that risks for children, young people are often in and around their peer groups or the influences that parents and carers are unable to uh, have much power with because they're happening outside of the family home. The next group is the joint action group and uh, earlier you would have heard me allude to the 
uh, town centre task force, this is effectively what we now have in place of that. So the joint action group will be the place that looks at themes and trends across our borough and targets responses to those themes and trends. It will be evidence based. It will be we will be able to talk about the number of reports in a specific area, etc. So the activity that we've got is well targeted and well used, given that it's not limitless. Uh, the joint action group was only it's only taken place twice uh, since it's set up, but it's already bearing some fruit. The idea would be that we would be learning as a partnership about what actions work in what areas and what we can lift and drop into other areas where we need to. And the last group is the street community group, recognising that we have a specific response to that community and looking at the trends and themes and where people might be moving around our borough. There are local structures um, in terms of what we see from a community safety partnership on the ground and above those are our Safer Crawley Partnership, the Prevent Operational Group and our Serious Organised Crime Group, all of which report into the Partnership Tactical and Tasking and Coordination Group that's chaired by police colleagues and that we represent on. I'm going to hand you back over to uh, Shane now. Looking at the um, partnership structures and initiatives, um, we've got the West Sussex Violence Reduction Unit um, or the, the new West Sussex Violence Reduction Unit, should I say, it's funded by the Home Office to take a community approach to violence reduction. Uh, albeit I think things have been delayed slightly, we've not been able to get into schools due to COVID. Uh, also in line with the problem profile, we've put additional funding for interventions into Crawley, Ada uh, and Worthing and Aaron. Um, that group has three broad priorities and success factors, uh, reducing all uh, school exclusions, permanent and fixed term, developing engagement opportunities and platforms with young people, working together to reduce risk of serious violence amongst young BAME victims and perpetrators. That's chaired by Superintendent Miles Ockwell. Uh, it's formally a non-police driven initiative, but clearly there's a need for um, Sussex Police involvement in that. Meetings have now started and uh, are taking place every six weeks. Looking at the data that um, this group is, has been analysing, it throws up some interesting challenges around targeting activity. Uh, factual figures can include many things such as those stopped with weapons, uh, crimes where weapons are used and threatened use of weapons and indeed negative searches even where the, uh, the aspiration for the search was to locate a weapon and it hadn't been located. Um, I think when, when this data is developed, um, it will be shared wider. So I think if, if we shared what, what is currently there, that there'd be concern that there were hot spots appearing when in fact some of those locations were actually search locations that hadn't yielded uh, any results. It's early days for that partnership. However, they're setting a structure for a free standard, uh, stranded approach to reducing hospital admissions as a result of violent acts. And the West Sussex Contextual Safeguard and Steering Group, which um, Paula had uh, just mentioned in the previous slide. Just hand back to Paula. Uh, other key partnership structures uh, relate to the Domestic Sexual Violence and Abuse Steering Group. Uh, we have a Pan Sussex Domestic Abuse uh, Framework, which has um, really shown uh, marked improvements over the approach across Sussex and the West Sussex uh, group is chaired by ourselves, which um, it, it, it it kind of places Crawley on the map in terms of its ability to drive that agenda uh, around those impacted by domestic abuse and sexual violence. We also have a raft of stalking champions who are trained and uh, will lead on issues of stalking. What we know about stalking is that it's pervasive in its nature and it often um, it often holds real risk for those individuals that are experienced stalking. So we have our own stalking champions. In addition to that, we have our own modern modern slavery champions, which re which relates back to our our serious and organised crime priorities. The four uh, priorities for our our partnership is our serious and organised crime, our street community, protecting vulnerable individuals, and business crime. I'm going to hand it over to Shane to talk you through the serious and organised crime. So looking at the objectives, as, as you can see there on the slide, um, 
there's been updated priority setting um, to the uh, Crawley and Mid-Sussex serious and organised crime focus areas. Um, we have moved towards holding a divisional lead responsibility for human trafficking, modern day slavery across West Sussex, whereas historically we had focused on um, just uh, Crawley um, as, as an area. Now we're working um, uh, across West Sussex and each um, different district is taking a different priority on behalf of West Sussex. And I think that just gives us additional breadth and um, ability to call on additional resources um, when when we identify that we require them. Uh, a 3P management plan, um, so it says 4P there, but dropping the pursue um, P in that uh, has been produced by the group and that includes a draft table for some specific tangible outcomes. Uh, initial group membership has been agreed now and, um, uh, and present with uh, further Im invitations sent out to address um, any identified gaps as the meeting has evolved. Uh, the meetings do take place bi-monthly. The first one was on the 6th of August this year um, and the, the last one was on the um, 6th of October just gone. So fairly early days with um, with setting the new priorities there, but actually the uh, the group has invested well in upskilling themselves in order to sort of ready for the tangible outcomes that have been planned. I'll just take this. So we're just having some technical difficulties there with mute, but um, uh, looking at the um, prevent uh, update for Crawley. So Crawley's not been, um, it is no longer a tier two uh, site for counter-terrorism. Um, Crawley is represented on the overall West Sussex Prevent Board and uh, the operational group there established um, that uh, effective multi-agency partnership working um, is still absolutely key. The information sharing amongst partners um, is still there to take place and also contribute to the overall West Sussex Prevent Board. I think it's recognised that um, the Tier 2 status has, has perhaps changed, but the good work can't stop. Apologies, uh, that was my my clumsiness with my uh, my fingers. So uh, apologies for that. So thank you, Shane. Um, so I would like to talk to you about the COVID um, responses. So when we uh, when COVID originally came into play in March, we had 89 people accommodated um, during that 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 initial period. We've currently got 14 people in temporary accommodation from that group. And we've had a raft of referrals to other um, support services such as Hope in Action, YMCA and Camfield. The successful outcomes, as we could see, is that the 22 um, who are at Crawley Open House um, and four that are in the move on houses through Crawley Open House, et cetera, have, sh have shown some real success. What, what COVID offered us in many ways was leverage to support those individuals that had previously found it quite difficult to access support. So there is there's a glimmer of hope in this. I think generally the Community Safety Partnership and the Crawley Borough Council Partnership to COVID um, and the vulnerable members in our community is, is probably what I would consider to be unrivaled. So we have the previous slide I mentioned that we have still have 20 um, in the September uh, street sleeper count, we still had 20 people in our environment, but we're still very concerned about and we'll continue to try and work with those groups. So if I, um, I'm going to move on to talk about some of the current challenges and I'm going to pass um, on to Shane to take this slide. So just looking at the um, bullet points on there um, in a bit more detail. Uh, so antisocial behaviour do does remain an ongoing challenge um, and to some degree it has been amplified by the current COVID situation. Um, perhaps not amplified in its current form, it's um, it's changed uh, from traditional antisocial behaviour. The sort of traditional reports has moved very sort of insular and very localised um, as people's focus becomes on, on their own sort of neighbourhoods and, uh, and neighbours. Um, 
car parks there so street community impact in town centre locations such as car parks um you know that can remain a challenge but as, as paula said the 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 numbers for the homeless community in the area are down based on um th this period last year um, getting access to accurate data I think continues to, to be a challenge uh, with regards to policing. We've got new tools using um, Power BI being developed, which in the short term, I think it will, it will assist us internally. But longer term, it will mean that we'll be able to provide a number of data sets to external partners in, in a safer way, in a more controlled way. Um, also looking at um, town centre safety and security on there. So. Um, central government pot of 58k um, to the CSP um, for uh, COVID compliance and um, that's yet to be allocated but that, that's um, that, that's some funding there to be called upon um, for the town centre um, and also looking at um, what, what had been achieved previously around use of private security over the Christmas period um, last year and also to provide some reassurance um, when lockdown um, began to open up and looking at opportunities to um, to utilise that again um, and, and work in both uh, police and uh, private agency. Um, Britain First as well, Britain First leader Paul Golding um, has he's come to Crawley twice, firstly on the 11th of July with, um, with, with no notice uh, and uh, a small group again on the 25th of July um, with, with very little notice. Um, there's potential for them to return. However, there's currently no intelligence to say that that is the case, nor nor when it could be. The, the response from the local community, uh, I, I think, was admirable in the fact that it made it very clear to the individuals from uh, Britain First that they weren't welcome. Um, officers did attend the incidents from a public safety perspective, but um, made no arrests on either occasion. A strategy was subsequently set not to give the movement additional public exposure, and this seemed to assist in removing Crawley uh, from the group as a focal point. So if I take us through future developments um, now, uh, and we are cantering towards the, the end of our presentation. So some of the future developments are that we are co-funding across the six district and boroughs in West Sussex, uh, an analyst post which should support our understanding of data and better enable us to benchmark against um, other areas within, within West Sussex, but also look at the national picture. It should also give us some uh, greater, lev greater levels of uh, of understanding and detail to the data so that we get a bit more granularity and be able to forward plan. Another key event is that we have been the, the town centre now has its bid and the, the, the key priority for that bid is safety and security and, and supporting our businesses to thrive. And as such, going forward, the bid and the work of the bid should hopefully provide a greater level of reassurance in partnership with police and other safety colleagues. Um, to our town centre. The bid has had some, um, some delay as a result of COVID, but levy bills have now gone out. Um, and the work that we're doing that Shane previously alluded to around the town centre security should, should nicely lead us into some of the work of the bid. We're also looking at some other key local um, uh, issues that we might be able to sort of uh, drive forward, such as looking at our rapid response CCTV, etc., um, which is we're currently doing some investigations um, about at the moment. So all in all, I think we've got a busy year ahead and some specific challenges that come as a result of the pandemic. But I think our partnership approaches have led us to have some real success in the year. That is effectively the end of the presentation from myself and Shane. Thank you for your presentation. Um, the process for discussion will be as follows. Any Commission member wishing to speak should turn their camera on. This will signify to the Democratic Service Manager your request to speak. You will then be invited to speak one by one. When you are called on to speak, please unmute your microphone and check that your screen is surrounded by a red box before speaking, pausing for five seconds to allow for the time delay. 
please turn off your camera and microphone when you have finished speaking and are no longer live. All Commission members who have indicated will be called on to ask questions in turn, with officers responding to any queries raised. If there are any proposed amendments to the recommendation, then please propose these when providing comments. We will now begin the discussion. Please turn your camera on if you wish to speak. If, if no other Commission members um, have questions, I have a couple, if I may. Um, thank you, first of all, though, thank you for a very detailed presentation. Um, and I don't wish to be critical at all, but it, it would be nice perhaps to have an indication of how much cybercrime um, we have in Crawley, with all of us being um, bombarded with, with phone calls almost uh, weekly at, at home as a, a point for the future. Um, but also, I don't know whether you'd have this. There was um, a knife handing in session, I believe, at the Memorial Gardens. I just wondered how successful that was, please. Chief Inspector, have we got any figures on that? Uh, yeah, um, so I, I don't have the, the figures for it, but that, that's one of a number of um, amnesty campaigns um which we've not just run in Crawley but across uh, across West Sussex the um the ongoing work for those policing operations continues it's not work that's that's stopping and and in fact arguably if if we do stop then um, we stop becoming a, as effective but um what i would say is with regards to the uh, amnesty approach i think we actually see um we see better results from the education and getting into schools which is where we'd like to focus our efforts longer term uh, the amnesties require a, a willing participant to, uh, to to hand off any weapons to us whereas actually to, to get the education in in early before even um, arming then I, I think that's probably a more effective approach in my opinion uh, thank you and the only other thing I noticed on on the report is that three bridges Northgate and West Green indeed they have three PSOs. Um, we're in Pound Hill, we've only got one for as an example. Is that because the, the crime is more centred in the town centre? Is there anything we can do about that? Or? Yeah, so the, um, the the allocation of uh, PCSOs is, is generally based on um, on demand and that's uh, policing demand that's that's been allocated. Also geography plays a bit of a factor in in that as well. Um, and and also uh, around the actual PCSOs themselves, some some may um, be in a job share, um, some may be part time, etc. So the allocation is there, sort of overall based on a number of factors. So um, just looking at the number of uh, officers assigned to an area is not necessarily indicative of the service that that area receives. Thank you. All commission members now. No, have any others? Councillor Burgess. Thank you. Um, yes, I have a, a question. Um, on the agenda, it said item five, the Safer Crawley Partnership Annual Update. But in, in, in the, the blurb that said it also talks about the Safer Sorry, the Community Safer Partnership. So is the Community Safer Partnership part of the Safer Crawley Partnership? That's one point. The second point is that at the Council, we have an outside organisation called the Community Needs Partnership, on which there are five councillors, Councillors Ailing, Councillor Brenda Burgess, Councillor McAnally, Councillor Malik, and Councillor Pendlington. That group, to my knowledge, has never met. Is that group part of the Safer Crawley Partnership? That's the first point I would like, and like clarification on that bit first, please, before I ask my, my second question. So uh, the Safer Crawley Partnership Executive is the overall partnership, and with regard to the other group, unfortunately, I, I'm not aware of that group, so we'll have to bow to somebody that might have that, uh, that, that information. Right. 
Okay, okay. Um, Councillor. So I'll have to, uh, it looks like I'm going to have to ask somewhere else then for that information. I think Councillor Burgess. Sorry? Sorry, there was an issue. Carry on. Um, right, the, the second issue, um, Chief Inspector Baker mentioned um, uh, the police working with West Sussex districts on uh, serious and organised crime. But Sussex Police is a pan Sussex organisation. It serves both East and West Sussex. Therefore, presumably, there is a similar group dealing with East Sussex as well as with the, uh, this, the group that's dealing with West Sussex. Isn't that a dilution of resources? Would it not be better for her to have a the serious and organised crime being pan Sussex rather than just West Sussex and then also East Sussex? Uh, sure, this, this is a local approach to those groups that already exist at that level. So as you can imagine, serious and organised crime um, is, you know, at, at its top point, international. Um, and then we've got National Crime Agency looking at, at the issues nationally. Um, and this is actually when you distill it down, um, this is our local response to those issues. So it doesn't um, it, it doesn't take over the pan Sussex response that's already there for dedicated teams. This is about how we interpret the serious and organised crime priorities locally and how um, if we if we sort of capture it at the top end and capture it at the bottom end, then actually we're attacking from two points. OK, thank you. Councillor Sharma. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much. A very well presented report, very thorough, and really appreciated that. I think one of the things that interested me in that was your list of BCSOs and the areas to cover. In my other role as a youth worker, I mean, I always had a list of them at the back of my desk. I remember during the COVID period trying to throw an incident, trying to ring each and every one of them, and like you said, Practically everybody had changed and moved on and I found it. And I think it was only my persistent as a counsellor that I finally got a hold of them. And I think Steve came to my rescue. I uh, would appreciate that if an updated list could be provided. I think in this day and age, when so an email, okay, changes will be made. But I think if an email could be sent, it'd be just as easy for us to print it and have updated list because it is quite often easier to be in touch with your own local PCOs rather than sort of going down the houses. Otherwise, thank you very much. A good report. Just, Just to say, I think, I think we can add the list of the PCSOs to the information bulletin. I don't know if Shane has anything to add to that. Yes, I do. Um, so firstly, I sympathise in um, in sort of days gone by and trying to keep the, the logistics of those lists up to date. Uh, it's very difficult and I think we've probably planned a step beyond um, sending the uh, the email round as well because that often misses out some key partners or is, even as partners and stakeholders change, um, then that can get um, dropped off of the email. So there's actually a, a planned change to the Sussex Police website, um, which will um, which will list all the PCSOs for the relevant areas, um, and then a phase two to that is actually tied to tie that into our. Uh, HR system so that as those moves and changes happen, the website gets updated with the um, with, with the new personnel. As I said, the churn is quite high of staff for PCSOs as they transition into being police constables, many of them. So um, I think to give you a centralised online list that is um, always up to date is is the the is where we're trying to get to. Thank you. You're on mute, Sorry, it's the old mute thing. Um, I just thought if we've come to the end of the questions, it's just worth reflecting on on where we were um, uh, when we presented last year. And I think that the town was seeing significant problems in the in the town centre linked to serious organised crime, to county lines, to um, uh, sort of modern day slavery trafficking on the streets in terms of in the form of begging etc and I think the um, 
the danger would be for us to think that all that stopped as a result of COVID. But if you cast your mind back, I think all partners did a, a fantastic job in tackling what was a multifaceted issue and, and starting to bring the town centre back for the people of Crawley. Um, and that included a lot of high profile successes, some of which we publicised at the time, some of which you would have seen in the press. So uh, I just wanted to, to basically highlight that. I don't think, I think they, the office has been quite um, modest in the presentation, just how much work has been done over um, uh, the previous year. And absolutely central to that has been the, um, the, the partnership working that's taken place. So yeah, I just wanted to put that on record at the end of, uh, at the end of this item. Uh, I've got my, my camera on. I want to speak again, please. I've got my camera on too, but I'm not sure anyone's seen me. Can you, Councillor Barry, your camera's not on? It, 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 well, it's, it, it's showing us on. Can you turn it off and on again, please? And Councillor Burgess, you're live. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, just a couple of quick points. One is that um, a few years ago, um, councillors uh, used to get regular updates on various police activities in, in their particular uh, ward, so we could see um, how the how figures for the various sorts of criminal activities uh, were going uh, as time went by. That seemed to stop some time ago, and I personally would be would welcome it being back again. Uh, and on a more uh, more mundane but personal point, uh, could you, uh, uh, Chief Inspector Baker, could you pass on the great thanks from the councillors of Three Bridges for the work that Kieran, as the PCSO, is already doing? Please. Thank you. Um, so to, uh, to comment on the first point around the um, uh, crime statistics being available and, and published regularly. Um, we, we've, we've moved towards uh, centralised uh, reporting. As as I said earlier, we're, we're looking at this new tool, Power BI, which will give us a far greater way to carve and sort of dissect the data in in lots of different ways. Um, and and that is something which I'm I'm hoping that we can get that to a point where that is um, shareable, not just with yourselves, but also publicly to be able to put that onto the likes of Police.UK. Um, and and share that information as it as it uh, updates more regularly than just a um, you know monthly update or or, um, or, or perhaps even quarterly etc that that you might have been used to. We're trying to move towards a, a live um, live status update of our data. Um, and the uh, second point around Kieran, the PCSO uh, for Free Bridges, I will certainly pass on the thanks. Um, he, he's he's a good one. He'd be very pleased to receive that. Thank you. OK, thank you. Councillor Barrett. Yes, thank you. Can you can you all hear me now? Um, yeah, I don't know what happened there. The camera, um, for some reason, the camera didn't come on. Um, really, just to say, as everyone else has, has said, thanks for an excellent presentation for, and for all the work that's been done, um, particularly around the town centre, which, um, as Ian said, has been um, an excellent piece of work. Um, I would also just like to comment on the PCSOs um, because there was this discussion about um, about the numbers per per neighbourhood and, and obviously the, the geography and the size of the neighbourhoods um, and really just following on from what the chair said about having one for Pound Hill. I really just wanted to say how much I welcome the fact that um, the people of Forge Wood already have their own PCSO um, that was mentioned on the list because as as you and I know, Chair, there is there is a certain perception amongst some residents in Forgewood that they're a bit of a forgotten area and that they don't receive the same level of services um, that other neighbourhoods have. So it's really good that um, the police have actually set aside a specific PCSO post for what is obviously a relatively small neighbourhood at the moment, but it's growing every day. So, you know, thank you for doing that. That's, that's really appreciated. Um, I did just have one question. If we could go back to slide 12, which is the one that um, shows the number of rough sleepers by month for uh, the last financial year. Um, really, I know Paula did touch on this um, in terms of the numbers um, as a result of the pandemic. 
what's very clear if you look at those figures is that we had a relatively stable population until about this time last year and then all of a sudden there's an almost 50 percent well it, it is virtually 50 percent increase from 32 to 47 and then those numbers stayed roughly constant uh, through to march and it, it seems as though there, there was that sudden jump in between november and december last year and it wasn't obvious to me what the reason behind that was so i wondered if anybody could tell me what you know what's behind that So um, I think that it, it, it's a bit hard to tell. I think some of it is, um, you know, we can attribute to national issues. So if you see a change in, say, benefits positions, change to universal credit, you can you can start looking at the sort of national influences. It's very hard to say, but it does it does appear that we've had a fairly stable population, but there have been a couple of peaks. So when I think about when I came into post in um, you know, just over sort of 18 months ago, we had a, a real chronic um, group of people in, in the in the 40s who were regularly in the same place, and we 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 made some real inroads with those people. I think it is a fluctuating piece, and I think it's very very hard to it's very hard to kind of pinpoint exactly what causes it. I guess where we have to be clear is what our response is, and that is, you know, offering help to those that will receive it, supporting people off of the streets because we know that's in their best interest, using enforcement measures when they don't, when they when 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 they behave in a way that's antisocial, um, and I guess it's uh, about us keep maybe asking, maybe that's something we could take on is actually look at the numbers and see if there's a way in which we can say to people what was the thing that. That, that, that took you to the streets and I think the work of Call the Open House would be key to that so I think it's very hard but you can sometimes see where there's financial challenges nationally you see a fallout etc changes in major policies around housing for instance and I think the big anxiety would really be looking at the impact of unemployment for our borough um, and uh, neighbouring areas and, and, and what that might bring and I guess our responsibility is to try and keep those numbers as low as possible I think I'm happy to take a look at it and have a better look um, at what the causal factors are. OK, thank you very much. You're most welcome. As uh, all Commission members now have had the opportunity to speak, we will move on, move on to the recommendation. I move that the Commission notes the update and that the views expressed during the presentation and any actions are acknowledged and documented by the officers. I ask the Vice Chair to second. Councillor Rana, please, can you second? Yes, thank you, Chair. I second that. Thank you. I would just now like to thank Chief Inspector Baker for attending tonight, along with the officers, and providing such an interesting and informative presentation. Thank you again. I believe we have an item from Democratic Services now concerning Councillor Lanza. Right, well, thank you, Chair. I assume this is the declaration of interest, is it? I mean, I just for the record, uh, Councillor Bob Lanza, Pantheon of South and Worth Ward. Agree the minutes of the previous meeting, no declarations of interest for this meeting. Thank you, Councillor Lanza. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lanza. We will now move to the transformation plan update. It's a report from Ian Duke, Deputy Chief Executive. Within the constitution, the RSC has within its responsibilities function and remit to review and scrutinise the Council's transformation programme. So please can I ask Ian Duke to introduce and present the report to the Commission. Thank you. Ian, you're on mute. I'm sorry, that's two for two. Um, my apologies. Um, 
I think last time I was in front of you on the transformation plan, it was last um, last June. At that time, we were talking in broad directions of travel. We at that point hadn't quite um, finalised the, uh, the the transformation plan for last year. Uh, what uh, members will have in front of them today is um, two reports, essentially one that, that gives you um, a, a progress report on um, the, 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 the plan that did come to fruition last year and a second, a revised transformation plan. And the fact there's two, I think, speaks to just how much progress there has been in the last, um, well, 15 months or so. Um, and there's two reasons for that. One, I think, is um, a huge amount of background work um, that, that has been done by officers and you will, you will see that in the report. But also, I think um, that the challenges of COVID have really accelerated aspects of the transformation plan. Some of the things that we were talking last time around, around having new ways of working, getting ready for the new town hall about our values and behaviours, um, uh, really came to the fore um, um, this spring. Um, if we were to take the digital transformation, for instance, um, members wouldn't have seen very much about what was happening in the background and all the work that was done in order to get our IT systems to where they should have been. Um, but it did mean that we were able to roll out the technology that you're using today um, right at the end of March. And that meant that council business was able to continue in terms of day-to-day -day services. It took a little longer, obviously, for, for, for meetings such as this. But it allowed council services to carry on in a different way, but in a, a way that, that still um, provided services to, to local residents and allowed us to uh, operate as a council. And so you got this this big jump and that that's um, uh, that was a new way of working that was instigated pretty much in a, a three day period. Um, um, that would have taken months in in any kind of normal context. Um, and so you see this when you um, you have a look at the, the transformation plan, the, uh, uh, the the review of of last year's transformation plan, whereby the town, the new town hall. Uh, those of you who've driven past the existing town hall can see the, the looming structure over it. It's just starting to get the eighth floor built uh, and that's on on track to deliver. So much so um, that, that we're now talking about that being business as usual. Um, rather than a transformation driver. Digital, likewise, um, a lot of our infrastructure that we need to, to make the next leap is in place. Instead of talking about um, transforming our IT, it's really about now how our IT can help transform other services and that's, that starts to become the focus moving forward. Um, new ways of working. We, I mean, there really has been, we never expected staff to, to move at that pace um, to, to be in such a, a different place. So, you know, in a way, the ordering of this kind of switched overnight. Um, I guess the challenge that we have moving forward is very much about embedding that change and making sure that it's the right change, making sure we haven't gone too far in some directions. Um, you know, there's been a lot of support for staff and for managers about how you manage organisations in, in a virtual context. Um, it's all too easy to rely on presenteeism, but, but that doesn't exist anymore. So how do we need to work in a different way? So we're still learning on that. Um, one of the things that you will see coming up, which is a real game changer, um, and, um, is our telephony. So. The, um, the, the laptops that you have in front of you, um, well, for officers at least, will also become our telephones in the future, so we don't need separate mobiles. It makes us truly, um, truly mobile and truly agile in terms of where we work in the future. Um, values and behaviours, it's, it's too easy, I think, to um, uh, not to think about culture. Uh, and I think, it, from memory at the end of the last time I was in front of you, I said kind of the, the culture is almost the biggest challenge because it's so difficult. Um, I think the good news for you as members is the officers have shown really their values and behaviours throughout the last six months. The, um, the way they have uh, adapted and responded to the challenges thrown in front of them, I think it's been remarkable. Um, and it just goes to show that the foundation stones are really in and the values and behaviours that sat on there and that staff hold each other accountable for, other values and behaviours that staff themselves developed 
um, which is, uh, I think, really why people have grabbed hold of them. We still have some work to do, however, in terms of making sure they're embedded in in the way we do our human resource, our people work moving forward. So it's not just about once you're in, it's about how do we use them to recruit? How do we use them um, in a far greater range of things so that's truly embedded in the organization? Service redesign. Um, we've had some successes on that, but this is um, an area that, that probably wasn't as time dependent on the town hall. Um, the original transformation plan we envisaged going over a longer period where we've reviewed it more quickly than we um, expected. And so we're not as far along with, with some of these as possible, but we've also had to revise it, taking into account um, the changing environment we're facing, which I'll come to in the next section. And then finally, commercialization. Um, and that's, uh, that, that, that's a, a similar story, really. Lots of, uh, I think, um, uh, wishes and wants to do last time and what you'll see when we move on to the new transformation plan is much more of a focus around what that needs to look like moving forward given some of the financial challenges and then finally again it's not stuff that you'll see but um, a lot of work about trying to reduce some of the more bureaucratic elements of what we have to do um, this is not about um, things that um, that, that are, are nice to do. It's, it's really things that we, we have to do as a council, but we think we could do in a, a much more efficient way. And we've been using that really to try and free up resource so we can put that resource into kind of more uh, productive parts of what we do. So that's the, um, that's the, uh, the, the, the review. Um, when we talk about transformation, I think it's really important that we, it's a temporary space. We put something into transformation when we want to change it. And once we think it's changing and up and running, we take it out and put it somewhere else. It becomes business as usual. So this transformation plan really looks at, at the new stuff we need to do um, within this space and the stuff that we will continue to do. Um, and I'll just do a quick run through because I suspect that um, this is where some of the um, uh, questions will be around. Um, We've again got six pillars. Um, the first is around channel shift, and that's really reflecting kind of the huge shift that we've seen in, in online um, work that we have to do. And that's not just about staff, that's about how residents are increasingly wanting to deal with us. Um, it has potentially huge advantages to the council in terms of efficiencies. Um, there's there's a figure at the bottom of page 27 of your papers, which you may have seen elsewhere, which kind of talks about um, for a transaction, something that can be done online can cost 15p, whereas a face to face contact will cost you near nine pounds. Um, and just above um, that on the same page, you'll also see a measure of where we are in terms of our transactions. And um, the further to the left you are with this is the more manual and the further to the right, the more automated. Now, this doesn't mean we're trying to get everything over to the right because manual process have got a really important function, but we certainly uh, are trying to shift this graph more towards the right over, over the next year or so. Um, as I said, new ways of working. There is still a lot of work that we need to do to, to embed the, um, the significant strides that we've done around getting agile working really embedded. We talked about the, I've talked about the desk phones slightly earlier. Um, there is a big piece of work I think we do, assuming we, we get to something approaching normal in the future about what that looks like within the town hall, the new town hall. We are not specifying what the office space looks like at the moment because what I suspect whatever we, we design now will, um, will, will not look right in about um, six, 12 months. Um, so we're, we're holding fire on, on some of those decisions until we absolutely have to take a decision. Um, members will also know sort of within the ways of working that um, there's a new intranet, new website up. The intranet is, is particularly important for us because moving forward that will have a lot more functionality. It will almost become when you switch on your computer your starting point and it will be set up in a way that suits you rather than just uh, a bunch of information which it is now. So that's that's one to watch. I think in the next year or two, we're quite excited about the developments on that. Um, people strategy. Um, 
we talked about embedding or I talked about embedding values and behaviours. Uh, and this is what this is really about. It's about getting in all parts of the organisation. One of the um, uh, things that we have spent a lot of time as a leadership team doing during COVID is just trying to make sure everyone is OK in terms of our staff. It's a very different working environment. You might not see your colleague face to face for a long period of time. People having to work in spaces in ways cut off from their colleagues. And whilst we've had a little bit of reprieve from that in the last couple of months, we're going to go back into that. So huge amounts of focus on well-being, um, uh, much greater focus on, 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 on people within the organisation, but also that piece about, um, you know, how do we recruit better? How do we retain better? How do we develop our own um, skills and, uh, um, and uh, knowledge base so that people can progress in the organisation as part of that retention. These are all things we want to have greater focus on in the coming year. And then um, service redesign um, and also um, the commercialisation piece that follows. This is really fitting now hand in glove with the, this, the, the kind of budget strategy that you will have seen um, in, in a different space in the all member briefings about how we are trying to respond as an authority to meet the financial challenges of COVID, how we are seeking to better support our communities, uh, even within those financial challenges and provide better services and how we um, perform better as an organisation. So you will see um, a lot of stuff in here that relates right over to our, our kind of emerging budget strategy currently. And then finally, um, assets. Um, there's um, really good time to think about how we utilise our assets. It's been an awful lot of time uh, spent on, on the new town hall and thinking about that, but that's only one of a, a broad range of assets that we have. Um, how do we, for instance, uh, ensure that our patch teams are based as much as possible within their patch rather than having to travel to and from Metcalf Depot, um, where we found the uh, the patch team that's um, based over in Viewbush, the West team. Um, we've seen greater levels of innovation from there, but that's largely because they've been able to be self-sufficient and they also have greater time because that, that waste of going and having to pick up equipment and bringing it back onto site is, is not there. So, so that's one of the areas that we'll be looking at within the assets piece. We're going to keep this relatively small at the moment. There's a focus on how we can use those assets that we have to generate revenue, again, linking back into our, our budget strategy. Um, um, but it, it's really about how we, we, we think in a, um, a more futuristic way about the assets we need and how we use them. Um, and that in a, a whistle stop tour um, is is probably it for now um, to to allow other things to come out as as part of the questioning and conversation. Thank you for the report. The process for discussion will be as before. Each commission member will have the opportunity to speak. Please indicate by turning your camera on. When you are called on to speak, please unmute your microphone and check that you are live before making your comments, pausing for three seconds to allow the time delay. Once you have spoken, please ensure your camera is turned off and mute your microphone. Thank you. We will now begin consideration of the report. Councillor Lanza. Yeah, um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ian, for the report. I'll, I'll go through um, by page number, if that's OK. Um, on page 11, there's a reference to assets and uh, potentially delivering a revenue for some of our assets. But I, I think as well, we should look alongside um, other partners um, at the possibility of some disposal of uh, corporate assets. Uh, to, to realise at the bottom of, on the top of page 14, which is Appendix A, which is the kind of business of you, as usual area, we refer, of course, to the um, uh, Town Hall uh, project. And I've, I've always been a, a supporter of, of um, building a new Town Hall rather than refurbing an existing one. But you made some comments about office space and in the light of events with, with COVID, what are we doing to 
make the proposed grade A office space, and it's important to make the point that it's grade A. What are we doing to preserve its attractiveness to uh, the market? And is there any need to review the underlying business case there? Because the, the rental income uh, from the grade A office space was always important uh, to, the, to the business case. Um, at the bottom of page, page 19, there's out of work hours working and looking for evidence to address inequalities in terms and conditions. I just wondered if you could give more detail about what those inequalities um, might be. Um, on page 20, um, near, near the bottom, it says review our corporate debt recovery policy process and procedure to maximise recovery. Now, that's a great project because every year, every year we, we write off debts having gone through major efforts, every, everything we can possibly think of to recover them. So what's different about this? I mean, it's laudable to um, really put the boat out on debt recovery, but what, what do we have in mind that's different? And would there be some impact on some quite old historic debts if we're, if we're successful with that? And then in Appendix B, page 27, We've got some diagrams there which are the state transaction costs, which um, of course are much less with online, less than telephone, which is itself less than face to face. But we make a remark there that we're talking about nudging people away uh, from cash and check payments. But elsewhere in the report, we talk about banning uh, check payments. So is it a nudge? And we're really going to, you know, st still afford open, keep those channels open for people who need them. Can we just be clear on that? Because I think a lot of people. Nick, would you like to answer um, the first couple of questions that Councillor Anza has uh, raised? I don't know whether Councillor Anza can hear your replies at the moment, but um, if you could uh, at least start addressing one or two of his questions there, please. Uh, Nick, can you unmute? Sorry, not Ian. Three, sorry. Three for three. It's been a long day. Sorry. Right. I, I know. Um, I know another Duke. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. A Nick Duke. Okay. Um, the um, yeah, I, I may have missed um, one because um, I think Council Lands also broke up near the the beginning, but I'll do my best. Um, the disposal of assets. I think it will be. Um, I think it will be on a um, an opportunity by opportunity. We are part of. Uh, we do have discussions of like so one public estate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but really, the, 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 I think the, the the focus is is where we can um, <laughs> where we can really generate a, a revenue right now, rather than a disposal. If a disposal meets broader strategic. Um, uh, aims, then then we we'll certainly look at it. But um, you know, I, I think revenue is king at the moment. Where we we can do that. Um, the town hall is a really interesting one, and you can imagine that we've had some significant focus on whether the business case still stands in the light of COVID. Um, the good news is uh, our commercial agents are very clear that it does. Um, we. Um, envisage or they envisage rather they advise that um, we are well placed regionally being um, you know just outside of London that as they, um, the, 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 the capital's kind of commercial market um, sort of recedes people see that there's a different way of doing work that they don't want to pay the huge amount of costs of being in central London that they will start to look at regional offices and indeed they're, they're starting to see those conversations happening. Um, at the moment, um, and I do say at the moment because it is a changing environment, um, we uh, are advised that um, uh, the, the kind of uh, square foot rental point, rate point, I think our business case was predicated on about £28 per square foot. Um, we're looking um, beyond that at the low 30s at the moment. Uh, so that gives us a little bit of scope. Um, we also possibly don't need as much room as we thought we did um, for, for the council. We were looking at three and a half floors. There's a question on, on that half floor and whether we do. So it's one of those bits where we're just going to push down the line a little bit while we um, 
while we really understand what the, the, the future looks like. Um, in terms of um, the terms and conditions, it's one I need to be, I, I, I can't say too much about other than um, the the way that we do business and the way that, that people kind of um, came into the council and the contracts they've signed, it changes all the time. And so for you have some historic things um, that, that um, one person will have and the person sitting next to them largely doing the other job may not have. And it's so it's a, an opportunity to just go and look at that and, and how it should be looked at. Um, that's what we mean. We're not talking about sort of legal inequalities or anything along those lines. It, it's just trying to get a greater consistency across um, across the piece. Debt recovery, I think the review is to to try and come up with an answer to the question you posed the council answer. Um, so, you know, we will see what comes out of, of the review um, and, and to see what that looks at. In terms of the cash and checks, it's a really, yeah, it's, a, it, it's an interesting one. I think there are some areas of, of our business where it seems to me that cash and um, uh, checks were probably at a point where we shouldn't necessarily do too much in terms of taking them on. Um, you know, especially if we're talking about your, your commercial, a lot of people have bank accounts, so it's strange that there's still a reliance on that. If you, um, uh, a lot of the th uh, time when we're uh, sort of getting new people onto services, we're, we're insisting on things like either direct debit or online payments. So it's really about bringing that into line again. Checks in particular are very expensive and cash um, yeah, is, I think we will continue to take cash for those people who absolutely have no option. Uh, but increasingly it makes sense to switch. And what we've seen during COVID is actually it's only a few that, that, that really need it. People have still been able to come into the town hall to pay by cash, by appointment. Um, those numbers are tailed off over time. Um, it's really been, a, I think, a, a convenience or a habit. Um, and that's where the nudge comes in because that habit seems to be changing voluntarily as, as people sort of adapt to, to the new reality. So uh, unless I've missed anything, I think those were the points that Council Lanza was asking. Um, yeah, through you, Chair, that, that, that covers everything. Thanks, Ian. Yeah. Okay. Councillor Barrett. Uh, right, thank you. Um, again, can, um, you know, can I thank Ian for a very comprehensive report and presentation? And thank all the officers involved for all the work that's been done. I think it's, it's clear from this report that a great deal has been achieved and particularly under the very difficult circumstances of the last eight months. And, and as Ian said, the staff have really stepped up to the mark when it comes to, um, to adapting um, to deal with the COVID pandemic and the particular needs of our residents that they're supporting. So thanks to everyone on that. Um, I've got a number of points. I wonder if, Chair, are you happy to take them one by one? Um, I, I find that easier personally. I think I think one by one will be fine, uh, Councillor Barrett. If, yeah, if, if, if Ian is happy with that as well. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Chair. There's four. I think there's five, if that's OK. The first one is, I suppose it's more of a comment rather than a question, but it's something that I, I suppose I would, would welcome a response on. It's just on the point about the new ways of working. Um, the, the paragraph at the top of page 11 in the covering report that talks about um, how teams have been able to support customers differently throughout the lockdown. And it says these imposed arrangements have been a catalyst to try and introduce new ways of working, which we will continue to adapt and develop, to adopt and develop. And I, I appreciate that. I suppose the one, what I wanted to say is just really to sound a note of caution, because we hear so much in the press at the moment about um, the new norm and moving to a new norm and all that sort of thing. And some people, I think, are are running with this a bit a bit further than than we actually need to, and seem to think that you know we're going to we're going to go into this new normality um, when the pandemic's over, where everybody will live their lives behind computers and smartphones, <laughs> and not speak to each other, and all the meetings will you know will be online and so on. And I mean, we've seen tonight with the problems that some members have had dialing into this these meetings that um, 
you know this is something we're doing because we've got to do it it's not something we i hope that we would want to do on an ongoing basis because you know people people are social beings we you know we we like to meet each other and um you know i hope obviously we can go back to face-to-face -face meetings and people will be able to work in teams again um in offices so it's really just to say i hope we're not going to sort of go too far down this route and try to make those things that we've had to do for the last eight months because there's no choice business as usual rather than going back to the you know working in a team environment in the town hall and having meetings and so on because apart from anything else we'd have spent an awful lot of money on a town hall that wouldn't be fully utilized <laughs> if anybody was working from home so it's it, that's really just my view on that i don't know if ian wants to add anything or do a response to that um yeah the uh, i agree I, I i don't think we'll go back to where we were i hope we don't go back to where we were but i think i think um that there needs to be some caution as to how far we will go um i think i said when when talking through the reports the work that we've um, done uh, alongside staff in terms of looking after individuals well-being and i think um we're seeing this both in the community we are seeing it with staff there is um isolation is not good for, for for humans people require different mm. levels of contact depending on the personality but overall contact is important um and i think we also saw in the first couple of months of the change whilst th a great deal of energy came through after a couple of months you could start to see the qualitative difference between and, and we see it in these meetings don't we between a face-to-face -face meeting and an online meeting there is a 10 15 percent difference in, in in the quality i think um so we know that we will never go to a point where it's um uh from from a staffing point of view we'll, we'll never go to a point where it's it's all um virtual um i think hybrid type approaches will start to become um uh will start to become an interesting option where some people are outside of the room some people are inside of the room and see where those dynamics are as i said again in the presentation we are delaying decisions on the kit for the new town hall until we absolutely have to take a decision because I don't think anyone can say with any confidence what it looks like. In terms of residents, um, I think one of the, the pieces on there is around access Crawley. Um, and I think one of the, um, the strands to that work is if we can do much more online in a way that suits people, do we release resource that means we can work with those who have the greatest need in a different way and actually give them more time? Um, and I think this becomes a key about actually when it's face to face, it's not just about those costs. It's where it delivers much greater value and where you can actually start to get beneath not just dealing with the symptoms, but maybe some of the causes, um, uh, especially with those, um, you know, residents who have ongoing and different needs over a longer period of time. It, get, it allows us to start to think in a much different way. Okay, well, th thank you very much for that. Um, the next one is on on page 17 um, of Appendix A under new ways of working. Um, it's just this point about actions remaining from the last transformation plan. Uh, and one of them is listed as the replacement housing management system. Mm -hmm. And it says the contract was awarded following procurement, project delivery team now in place. And timetable is spring 2022. And I really just wanted to ask about that because I do recall that um, an item went to the cabinet on this some time ago. It may be up as long as a year ago um, to actually uh, award the contract on that. Um, and it may possibly have come to OSC as well. That would have been before I came back on here as a member. Um, and I, it, it was a, a contract for a certain um, number of years, I think, to support it, if I recall. Um, but I was a bit surprised by that timetable of um, spring 2022, because that seemed a long time away. Um, it may possibly have been de delayed by COVID, but I just wondered if you could comment on that, because I'm, I would have thought, given that the contract was let some time ago, we would be looking at, at having having the system in place by then. Um, the, the project's on time. Um, it's it's in line with the, the, the program for this. It's a huge undertaking um, because the database is multifaceted. It's it's everything from your your assets to your um, 
your 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 residence database and all the repairs. It's effectively trying to bring together what are now, from memory, something like five or six different databases that operates independently, and we need to make sure that that system speaks to itself. So this is not a this is not a simple um, this is not a simple shift. What it will give us at the end is um, a truly unified view of of our tenants, of um, of the properties, um, and um, it also gives us a platform for for actually looking at the way we manage our assets in other areas. So we're we're taking a good hard look at this, for instance, around our commercial assets and whether this this gives us a system for for you know improving the way that that we manage those. So, so it is a big piece of work. Um, I think the um, that the report actually, um, and, and thank you, Heather, for the prompt, uh, went to cabinet in June of this year. So, um, it might have been the uh, the one that you were referring to was the 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 earlier um, ask to to go out to tender on it. But um, nonetheless, it is a, a long leading project because that's it's a complex one. It needs to be done properly. Okay, thank thank you very much for that. The next one is on page 19 under service redesign. Um, again, on, it's on the progress so far. It's talking, well, it's talking about the contact centre demand review to understand demand with a view to identifying failure demand, increasing channel shift and maximising impact using available resources. And then it goes on to say the review has been undertaken, identifying significant failure demand in the system. And I, I was quite disappointed when I read that because this does seem to be a recurring theme. I mean, when I think back to when I was the portfolio holder with responsibility for the contact centre, which is prior to 2012, <laughs> we were having reviews then, we had best value reviews, we had other reviews, which all showed failure demand in the system. And was and those reviews were all about trying to strip out that failure demand, on, I think they used to call it non-value demand. Um, and replace it with value demand. And we we were told we were there, and yet this seems to be saying we're not. And I just wonder, how, you know, how do we ever get to the bottom of it? I mean, may, maybe the standards are changing. Maybe we, we were saying then it was OK, and now we, we've got more exacting standards and, and you know, we, we class more things as failure demand. I don't know, but I, I, I just found it quite disappointing because it just seems to be something that goes round and round and round and comes back year after year after year. And, and will we ever get to the bottom of it? Um, so I think failure demand kind of makes sense. It's 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 quite judgmental language. So so you know it, it's I guess what we mean by that is inefficiencies and things that could be um, improved. Uh, what you have with the contact center and 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 the rest of the services is this kind of handoff point between actually what is best positioned at the front of house, and so that when you call, you're speaking to one person. Who can who can answer questions about a range of things versus the more specialist in in the back office? I think the the work that you're referring to um, made a, a whole sweep a whole array of improvements in terms of how that worked. But things like technology moves on. A lot of the things that we're highlighting is as part of this is actually where things could be put online again coming back to the channel shift there's links to to the channel shift agenda on this and actually make it a far more seamless process the stuff where we are only kind of partially able to do the work in the contact center still um, so although we've made some progress there's probably more we could do and then there's some that as services have changed you actually kind of want to kind of revert you'll never eradicate failure demand out of out of a complex system like a council there will always be some um, and as things change, more will be created unless you change with them. So I guess that's what I'd say. There's more that we can do. It's not to say that there wasn't a lot done previously. And I suspect that someone might be sat in front of in five, six years time and we'll, we'll find other other bits of uh, inefficiencies that we could we could do with improving. It's just the nature of the beast. OK, thank you. Um, then if we can move on to Appendix B, um, page 27 um, under channel shift. If I, if I could just take you to the graph that you talked about earlier, the, the bar chart with the transactions. I just would like a little bit of clarification. Um, there's, there's one section that's called partial and one that's called active projects, and I didn't quite understand what those actually meant. 
um, in terms of what what type of transactions they would be? Yeah, so um, I, I, I would be struggling if you were to say, ask me to put specific um, processes into each of those boxes. Um, but what we mean partial, it, it's something that's um, slightly more uh, automated than than just filling in an e-form. You know, on some of our services, a, an e-form is completed, but there is nothing at the back end that automates that. It still comes into a, a, an individual who then has to take it and process it and do something rather than being built into uh, one of our systems. So a partial is where um, you will have some of that done, but not all of it. So again, there's there's things that we can do to make that more efficient and, and make it less uh, uh, less costly. An active project is areas where we're starting to work on full automation, but we haven't. Uh, but but it's not quite got over to the full side yet. So it's really there indicatively to give you an idea of where we are as an organisation in terms of automating our processes and having the, um, the, the the most efficient kind of flow possible. OK, th thanks very much for that. And then finally, you'll be pleased to know on pay page 29 on the section on commercialization and pipes. I have to say this is one of the I mean, I think this is the first time really that this this concept of pipes has been has been put in front of members. I think certainly I'd like to know more about it. I, I imagine other members would. Um, but really, I mean, that's probably for another time, but it talks about um, developing partnership across the public, private, voluntary and not-for-profit sectors to deliver community-based services, which is all very laudable. I really just wanted to ask about the input from the private sector, because obviously an awful lot of private sector firms are struggling at the moment and will be even more so probably in a, in a month's time. And there's not a lot of money out there, there's not a lot of capacity. And I just wonder if what is happening nationally uh, um, and in, in, within the economy is actually going to have a negative effect on what we're trying to do here and, what, and we might find that it's not as successful as we'd hoped because of that. I just wondered what your thoughts were on that. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a big question. Um, we, you know, as a, as a council, we are reliant on, on various streams of income and, you know, I think we've been in the fortunate position in Crawley where, you know, from a, a business side, from an employment side, we've been in a in a, a really positive place. The the impact, the economic strife that, that we're starting to see and um, potentially has got a number of years to run uh, will will impact on that, whether it be um, potentially around business rates or or, or council tax income, um, people, you know, choosing to buy services that we provide but but are chargeable um, um, it's one of the things that is very much built into um, some of the work that is happening on the savings front and and is part of the reason why when we talk about the the, the financial context for the coming years um, there's there's a big piece of work to do there and that's obviously a conversation that we're having in in other areas there are things that we can do to help mitigate that uh, and that's very much what this is all about um, um, be that that we're, we're we're trying to put things in place to stimulate parts of the economy or support people going through change the good news is i think as much as there is good news um, that we are still seeing interest in in businesses wanting to be in crawling and that's not just from um, that's not just from the town hall experience where, where we've got people expressing active interest already um, but it's also what we're seeing in in some of these spaces that are becoming vacant within Manor Royal. The question is, is it the same economic structure that we want? Um, is it the higher value employment? Is it the lower value employment? But time will tell. So I'm not quite sure if that's answered the point you were trying to get to. Yeah, well, it, it was. I, I was really just trying to sort of flag up that maybe, maybe obviously we're, we have a particular target, particular things that we want to do within this this area of the transformation plan and i suppose i was just trying to flag up the fact that maybe that might get thrown off course by the fact that the, the private sector um are not going to be a, you know are not going to have as much um funding or capacity available to them um that you know as as might have been expected when this was, was first 
mooted. That's I suppose that's what I'm trying to get at. I'm, I've not put it across very well, but that's that's what I'm trying to say basically. I think the uh, it's called life. Um, I think that the, the great thing around the commercialization is trying to get everyone who's involved to be open to opportunity, um, to 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 have their heads up, to to scan what's in front of them, see an opportunity, and feel able to try and grab that opportunity if it's something that makes our services better, which gets us in a better financial position. And it might be that those opportunities are harder to find, but there'll still be opportunities. Um, but that means we just have to look that a bit harder and um, and be willing to grab it when it comes along. OK, thank you very much. Is that Ailings? Hello. Um, yeah, I just wanted to go back to what Richard was talking about is new ways of working. Um, having meetings like we're having now um, is not always a bad thing um, because we could also be saving money. We're not having the town hall open, not having um, electricity, not having to have staff in the building. And not that I'd want to make anyone redundant, <laughs> but I'm just thinking there's a positive to having meetings like this, not just negatives. Um, if if we do continue like this, even with it being um, COVID, we need to make sure that the devices are usable so that all the councillors can come to meetings because all their devices work properly. And we all we need to look at the effective use of air time because coming to meetings online is a lot more time effective than having to drive all the way to the town hall, drive all the way back, all through the traffic. Um, so, you know, there's lots of pluses for having meetings online. I don't want us to just completely go back to normal for normal sake when sometimes working like this is better than what was normal and i want us to look at that and and say well the meeting's only for three people maybe it's better to do it online rather than to have everyone going into the town hall i think it's a it needs to be a um a meeting by meeting strategy rather than say right now we're going to stop doing it online. We're going to go back to normal. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. I I, I think that's absolutely right. I, I think it, but it, it's really where that balance is in the future and and keeping choice um, so that that you know uh, people have the opportunity to do it in a way that works for them. Um, but that does I think that does include not not just relying on virtual full stop. Um, because there is that qualitative difference of being face to face, but absolutely right. You know, it's allowed people to be more flexible to get to meetings that they wouldn't have been able to otherwise um, and, and to have a better balance. Yeah, and also um, perhaps we could look into how many people look on it, public look online. Are we getting more people looking online than maybe coming into the town hall to the meetings, to the public meetings? because the public might prefer them online. I don't know, maybe we ought to, that's a consultation that we could do. Thank you. Certainly look at that. Hi, I would like to just um, come in on, on this point. I think there are advantages obviously to being online. Um, it saves the travel time, etc. Also, to counter it slightly, we do sometimes lose the creativity yeah. um, out of meetings. I mean, my husband has been working from home for seven months now, and yes, he's more productive because he's probably putting in more hours that would have been spent travelling. But he said you do miss the bouncing off of ideas. And I'm just wondering how we're going to give that and inject that creativity because there's no doubt, I think this this is going to be a way forward because it's going to save the car parking, the cars on the roads. There's a lot of advantages to be working like this. 
but somehow we've got to make, make sure we keep the creativity of, of work going as well for employees um, because there are benefits of bouncing ideas off each other. Sorry to over to you. Yeah, um, the we've just done a, another um, staff survey. Uh, we, we're, we're constantly doing them to to really as part of this, this trying to look after, make sure people are right, trying to work out where we can do things differently. Um, but what's come through is that there's a, a, a vast majority have really enjoyed a mix of the virtual working and coming in. Uh, and I think that's in that 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 shift to, to the mix is increased over time as people's nervousness about coming back into the workplace has decreased. They've experienced it. Um, but also exactly what you're saying, just bouncing off people or spotting someone that you wouldn't necessarily put a Teams meeting in to speak to, but actually it's really helpful just to have a quick five seconds chat with them in the corridor. It, it's those kind of interactions of bumping into um, people as well as, as you say, the creativity. Um, these are online. It, it's difficult to, to have a really relaxed um, uh, conversation in a way that, that's very spontaneous because it needs to be managed. Um, and that's what I mean about that qualitative gap that we've seen after we got over the excitement of being able to work this way. You did start to see just that 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 10 percent missing in, in some meetings. In others, it doesn't make a difference. And actually, it's much more efficient to do it this way. But sometimes there is a gap. Yes, uh, th thank you. I do. Is a, there's a fine line there that we've got to find, get the best from both worlds, haven't we, going, going forward. Yeah. Um, Councillor Jana? Rana. It's Rana. Rana, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Rana. That's all right, yes. Chair. Um, I just want to add on to what you just said and Marion just said. I mean, virtual meetings are okay. It's not that, but I... I used to really have a, I used to love coming in. I mean, I used to enjoy meeting, but I'm kind of losing interest now. And there are days when I think, oh, this is so boring. I don't think I like being a counsellor or thing like that. So I think we want to make sure of both though. We want, I don't think I would like to prefer a virtual meeting all the times. Like, like you said, we need something. I mean, it's kind of wears off after a while of meeting all the time. So we want to actually meet up and talk to each other and have proper meetings as well. Otherwise, I'm thinking, oh God, I don't think I want to carry on us like this anymore. You do lose interest after a while. I definitely do agree with that. Yeah, I um, I suppose I, I, I hope it's not this item that's um, pushing you to that point, Councillor, but I, 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 I agree, you know, in short, I agree. Um, I think as officers where we were starting to push it before the, the latest lockdown is is to start to move to the hybrid meeting, uh, a recognition that you can have people in the room and dialing in at the same time. Um, that's not fully supported currently. Um, we're, we're trialing out new systems, but you know, on the basis that we, we get through to the other side of, of all of this, it's something that we increasingly want to be able to do. And then there's an element of choice for people. That's the Burgess. Hello, uh, thank you. Um, uh, Ian, um, this the Appendix B is a is a what is it what is it described as exactly? It's the current transformation program. Mm -hmm. Yes, or transformation plan. I assume that in the light of what you've you've said and the fact that the fact that things will change, priorities will 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 their stress, their infra emphasis uh, will will differ from uh, time to time. There'll be another uh, transformation plan uh, coming out uh, in the not too distant future, which we will we'll be able to have another look at. I assume. Am I right? Correct. Um, Thank you. Indic indicatively, we're, we're you know we're, we're looking at this being about a two-year period, but that's what we thought about the last one, and we ended up changing it a lot sooner than that because of distance travelled and and contextual changes. So, 
but yes, you know, these things never stand still. Uh, mm. And as soon as you've kind of worked on one, there's a, there's a whole list of other things you want to get on with. Yeah. Because the thing is that, that I suppose that the biggest change of all that has happened is the change to sort of, you know, digital ways of working. Now, I can use a computer just about, but not, not too much. But now more and more people will be using computers, digital technology, more and more and more. And so therefore, you know, maybe 10 years down the line, all of these uh, paper ways of working will have gone, maybe. I don't know. But that's a, yeah, a distinct possibility. And it's something that we need to, to bear in mind, or I don't need to bear in mind because I'll have retired. But uh, people, need to bear, people need to bear in mind for uh, ways forward because um, you can never stop. You're always going to be moving hopefully forward. Okay. Yep, completely, completely agree. It never stops. Councillor Burgess, have you had have, have you finished, Councillor Burgess? Yes, I'd finished and switched off my micro my microphone and camera. Councillor Barrett, have you do you want to come back on anything? Councillor Barrett, you're on mute. No, you're still on mute, Richard. Sorry, thank you, Chair. I keep I keep pressing and it keeps muting and unmuting itself. Um, really, just to say on this point about the hybrid meetings, I mean, I think it's very much horses for courses that, you know, we we are we are clearly going to move to virtual meetings, for things like small internal meetings where it might be three people, you know, one councillor, two officers, that kind of thing. <coughs> the briefings that that seems very logical, but you know when we're talking about public decision making committees then that's very different and, and you know that's where you need the interaction um, but it was really just to say this point about hybrid meetings um, I know that the, the, there have been some issues about the actual legality of that and having hybrid meetings with having people that are in the room and, and not in the room and so on uh, over the years but um, I mean the idea is not new and certainly I can remember when um, when I was on an LGA committee um, quite a few years ago now, sort of up to 10 years ago, and the meetings were in London at LGA House. There was um, there was one particular member who was from a council in Yorkshire who used to appear by video link because he didn't want to come all the way down. And obviously the, the LGA or his council paying the expenses. Um, and so he used to be on a sort of hologram whilst everybody else were in the, in the room. So, you know, it's not a new idea and it is something that can be done. Um, but I know when it was talked about before the COVID pandemic, there were actually regulations that prevented you from being from actually taking part. And I think if you did that for a, committee, a formal committee meeting, you couldn't go um, um, by law. And whether that's changed as a result of these um, new new rules, I don't know. But of course, the rules we're working under are only in place until May anyway, and then then the government will have to either renew them or or rescind them. Yeah, I, I, that's correct. I mean, my, my focus really was the officer side of things. I hadn't really spoken. I wasn't really speaking to, to, to the formal committee, but you're absolutely right. Um, there's, there's there's nothing yet that allows us to hold um, hybrid meetings. Um, we couldn't do virtual meetings before all this started. So one assumes that that we will go in that direction. It's a bit strange, actually, that with the way that technology is moving on, that that isn't a, um, an option that's available. So we'll start with the officers and, and then we'll see, obviously, where the, the, the regs take us over time. Right, just uh, one or two for me, if I may, Ian, before mm -hmm. I jumped on on the meetings and a new way forward. I, I was actually um, on page 11 where we're talking about commercialization and the, the pipes model, which sounds very interesting. Um, and I just wanted to ask, did we actually recruit a funding officer? Because I know at OSC some time ago, we, we discussed this at, at length and I just wonder whether we did actually make an appointment to help us get different income streams. Um, so no, no recruitment as yet. Um, uh, the, the timing of the financial year and COVID sort of overlay 
perfectly. We we have had external support in terms of helping us with our our thinking, um, but it wasn't a, a great time to bring someone in and 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 deal with that with all the challenges we had going on at the time. So it's something that we were starting to really kind of looking to mobilise again, um, but lockdown has hit again. So we'll we'll keep that conversation active, but the, there is whether it's additional capacity, whether it's external resource just to challenge us and our way of thinking, um, you know, that 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 investment's still going to pay dividends down the line. Good. That's good to hear. Um, I was also um, intrigued to see on page 15 um, with the new internet, um, bringing a new user interface, not a traditional, but something radically different. So that, that sounds very intriguing. Any further yeah. on that? So um, I, I don't know if anyone's seen it. The BT used to have a futurologist and you went along and you would speak about what the world would be like in 15 years time. I don't think it ever happened. So I'm going to try and avoid doing that that kind of um, approach, but at the moment, the an intranet is our intranet has been uh, still continues to be, although it's got it's a lot better than it was, um, an internally facing website that that holds information. It's a library um, in the same way that that um, our our, um, our website is for 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 residents, visitors, etc. Um, what the intranet is likely to be in the future is a place where when you um, when you log on and you sit down to work, it's personalised. So what you will get as a member will look very different to that I get as a, an officer because we will be able to adapt it based upon your role, your function, your preferences to a, to a certain degree. Um, it's the things that you're doing with MS Teams at the moment can very much be embedded into that. So all we use MS Teams for at the moment is kind of the chat function and the meeting function. There is so much that sits behind it and and, and so many things that we can do um, to help us with that journey. So instead of seeing it as a, a website, see it almost as a virtual workspace that has all the tools and resources that you need to do and, and perform your role. Um, and that's conceptually what we're trying to do. We have a long way to get there because um, there are some applications um, that, that you will use currently that will work in that way. There are others that, that won't yet. So, so it won't just be a big bang, but it will start to change over the next couple of years and look and feel very different. And I think members will really appreciate it actually. I think you, you, you'll find it very useful. Right. Yes, I certainly, when I saw it there, I thought I was intrigued by it and thought this, this sounds good. Um, I would just like to thank you and all the staff um, for being so involved in the transformation plan. It's obviously covered all sorts of every area and the council is nothing without its staff. And it's good that everybody gets involved by the looks of things on this with surveys being done, etc. I was very, very impressed by the report. Um, so have all the Commission members had an opportunity to speak now, please? We'll now move on to the recommendations then, as set out in the report. I will move that the Commission has considered the report and request that the comments are expressed, are acknowledged and documented by the officers. And I will ask the Vice Chair to second, please. Councillor Rana, can you please second? Uh, yes, Chair, I second that. Is that agreed? That's agreed, thank you. You recommend it? Agreed? Agreed. 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 Any more? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. The, recommend the recommendations as set out in the report have been approved. Appointments. Appointments. Following the resignation of Councillor McNamee from Haas, the OSC needs to put forward a representative to the committee. Do we have any nominations, please? Councillor Barrett? 
Uh, yes, could I please nominate Councillor Bob Burgess? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do second Do we have a seconder, please? Uh, yes, I can. Yes, I second. I se okay. Thank you, Councillor Lanza. Do we have any other nominations from the floor? No, no other nominations. Will the Democratic Service Services Manager please do the recorded vote? Um, before you do, can I just say a few words? Yes, yes, Councillor Burgess, by all means. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it, it's a shame that uh, Councillor McElhaney was unable to carry on doing the, the job uh, that he was doing because being a member of, of HASC uh, was, is very important. And a few years ago, um, the district and boroughs had to fight quite hard to ensure that every uh, district or borough uh, had, a, had a say, had an input actually in that um, in that organisation or in, in that uh, meeting. Uh, and so therefore, I think it's a very important um, committee uh, of West Sussex. Um, and I think it's something where uh, by crawly issues can be highlighted at a West Sussex level. And I think that is very important. Thank you. Thanks. Heather? Yeah, I would just like to say uh, before the Democratic Services Manager uh, continues, uh, for record purposes, Councillor Malik is able to view the um, meeting um, feed, but he's unable, unfortunately, to communicate verbally. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Are you going to do voting? Thank Chair, you. As, yeah. as we've got uh, no other nominations, we don't need to record a vote unless there's any members who um, wish to dissent. We'll take it as a third and three of the two. Chair, moving a second. Right, Chair, second. Thank you. Um, I look forward to hearing your reports, Councillor Burgess, in future from HASC. I believe the next one is November the 8th. So hopefully you'll get some emails about that shortly. Um, forthcoming decision mm -hmm. lists. The forthcoming decision list is featured on your agenda and also on the council's website. I will ask Democratic Services team to list those that have already been referred, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, in terms of the uh, forthcoming decision list, um, I can give you the uh, following that have been referred to the OSC on the 23rd of November, and these will be for the 25th of November Cabinet. We have the uh, Koolyboa Local Plan, we have the Budget Strategy, the Treasury Management Mid-Year Review and the Budget Monitoring Quarter 2. There have been some movements on the forward plan. Uh, so there was, those are the four that have currently been referred to um, OSC on the 23rd of November for the 25th of November cabinet. Uh, the following have been referred to uh, February OSC, budget and council tax, treasury management strategy, budget monitoring quarter three, economic development strategy and article four directions. Um, with regards to the other items on the agenda, please can OSC members kindly let me know if there's any other items they would like referred to November. Please. Right, OK, there is no supplementary agenda. Therefore, with the business of the Commission concluded, the meeting is now closed at 21.01. Thank you and good night, everybody.
Good night. Thank you. Good night.